big deal. You know, that was really an accomplishment because he's trying. In the previous video, Dr. Tomlinson introduced the concept of mindset and how it can impact the effectiveness of instruction. In this video, she continues on this theme as she discusses what we as teachers can do in a fixed mindset institution like education to respond to students' needs and connect with them. In addition, Dr. Tomlinson will present classroom examples as she describes what differentiation is and is not. And now, Dr. Tomlinson. Good morning. Welcome back. Did you have a good day yesterday? Things going all right? Learning something? Thinking something? Are you having some, um, you know, I think two or three things can happen at a conference that works for you. One is you pick up some new ideas and new thoughts. How many of you are picking up a few new things to ponder? Good. And I think another thing that's valuable sometimes is that it reinforces things that you're doing. When you hear somebody talk about something you were doing, it kind of affirms that or gives you permission. Anybody having that experience? Anybody getting indigestion? That's legitimate, too. <laughs> OK, we'll um, we're going to start back again this morning with this session where the purpose really is to look at some of the big ideas of non-negotiables of differentiation that are necessary to make all the pieces work together. Much of what you're doing for the majority of the time you're here is looking at pieces of the puzzle. And the purpose of this session is to sort of help you see how the whole configuration comes together. And yesterday, we were looking at one big idea of differentiation, which is the importance of connecting with kids in order to sort of propel learning forward. And I don't want to spend too much more time on this this morning, because I think we probably made the point yesterday. But kind of the punchline of what we were talking about yesterday um, is sort of summarized in, uh, by Theodore Sizer, who said, one cannot teach a student well if one does not know that student well. And um, we looked briefly as we were leaving at the concept of, uh, of mindset, Carol Dweck's notion that while we don't stand up and say, oh yeah, I believe in a fixed mindset, in fact, lots of stuff in the world persuades us that it is correct, that ability comes from IQ, from genetics, from environment, that really there's only so much teachers can do to override that. And with a fixed mindset, we're willing to accept that some kids really are kind of limited in their capacity. Folks with a fluid or a growth mindset really believe that success comes from effort. And as Dweck says, just because one person can do something faster doesn't mean other people can't do it as long as they're willing to invest the time and the effort in doing it. School is a pretty fixed mindset proposition. And so you and I already start off with kids who know that when you do bluebirds, buzzards, and wombats, they're always the buzzards. They know that they're losers because they're in special ed classes. They know they're losers because they're st stuck with ESL things that keep them apart from the mainstream. And we know, and remedial reading, remedial math, all that stuff says to kids, you're the ones who can't. And there's so much in school that perpetuates that, that unless you and I really go in with that determination and conviction that we can get almost any kid anywhere they need to go, then again, that whole piece that propels learning forward is crippled in some ways. <coughs> One study that's interesting to me um, suggests that in, in a study with 47 elementary schools, measures of trust consistently predicted achievement differences in math and reading even when researchers controlled for race, for gender, for economic background. In other words, um, when kids trusted their teacher, they performed much better. When they felt that sense of connection, they did better in school. And that's regardless of genetics, regardless of environment, regardless of economics. When teachers believe their students are competent and reliable, they create learning environments that facilitate student success. In other words, the kids get it that we believe, and they go with us on that. When students trust their teachers, they're more likely to take the risk 
that learning entails. I don't know that we think too often as teachers about the fact that when we ask kids to learn, we're asking them to take a risk. But um, you look at adults, it's probably a stupid illustration, but on television where they put adults that aren't suspecting something out and ask them to dance in a funny way or ask them to try a skill or a technique that they don't know how to do. Um, I was here last Saturday at Cirque du Soleil. I don't know how many of you have ever seen that. <laughs> they brought people from the audience several times up onto the stage to do stuff with the uh, artists. And what the artists are doing looks so easy. You know, they're just, just body movement. I mean, how hard can that be? And they bring these people up from the audience who immediately go, you know, and rigidity sets in. <laughs> and you can just see for the poor guy in the audience who manages to finally go, that that was a really big deal, you know, that was really an accomplishment because he's trying something new and the world is watching and there's this person standing next to him that makes his stuff look easy and fluid and this thing for him is a big move. And that's kind of the way it is in class. There's this teacher in the front of the room who knows everything and you're pretty sure there are half the kids in the class that know all the answers. Somebody's asking you to answer or to put the problem on the board and it's just tough. When you have that sense of trust, it, it just really makes a huge difference for kids. This is really the um, bottom line, and, and you'll notice as we go through the rest of the morning and tomorrow, at the end of each section, there's a slide that's yellow, not on your paper, but here. And um, it really is sort of the big idea of the section. So in regard to connecting with kids, I think the point really is we can be content experts, we can know math, technology, science, literature, whatever it is, really, really well. We can be rule followers and we can follow that pacing guide as though we're glued to it. We can be the captains of tight ships and make sure nothing is ever out of order in that classroom. We can work really hard extra hours to make the classroom go. And if we don't really believe deeply in the worth and the possibility of each kid to succeed. Um, if we don't show kids that we truly trust them and care, then we're going to fall short of what we're investing in and the kids are going to fall short of that as well. And again, I said this to you yesterday, um, I've spent more time on this than I will any of the other sections just because I think we overlook it. Somebody said to me when we were leaving yesterday, it's good to hear this toward the end of the year because we get tired and we forget, you know, sort of how we felt when we started the whole proposition and that human piece of it. And I think, um, again, we can do a great job here of teaching you how to do raft assignments, of looking at KUDs, of managing a differentiated classroom, a thousand other things. But if you don't take time for that connection piece, it frays on you. Okay, let me get you for just a couple of minutes to, um, again, if you happen to be sitting next to somebody you don't know, be sure that you introduce yourself. But otherwise, talk for just a minute with somebody about this notion of connecting with kids. It's hard. You know, we've got too many kids, and there are too many pressures. So it's not like, well, sure, everybody does that all the time. It's, it's hard to do. It's, it's impossible to pull off completely. Um, how do you do that? And what do we do as teachers in an institution that is a fixed mindset institution? School really is much happier when we sort the kids who can from the kids who can't and you know, kind of take care of their needs that way, send the broken ones over here and leave the good ones with us. Um, what do we do in a fixed mindset institution to override that as teachers? Because kids come to us all the time with that fixed mindset, including, by the way, you, know, you can see how fixed mindset stuff um, erodes the confidence of struggling learners. But bright kids in a fixed mindset pay a real price too, because the assumption is if you're smart, you get it. And if you're not getting it, you must therefore not be smart. And it's one of the reasons that cheating is so endemic among smart kids, because they can't afford to take the risk of not looking smart. And they'll do whatever it takes to be smart. And that sense that you're, you're the smart one and that's what everybody expects of you actually in a number of studies has shown that it decreases kids' aspirations for themselves. They'll choose the safe thing rather than choosing the thing that causes them to grow. 
And so they choose down sometimes for schools or for majors in schools or for courses or for projects within a class. So this notion of fixed mindset and you've got it or you don't have it is dangerous for everybody, whereas the working for effort thing benefits everybody. So talk about those things for a minute. How do you feel about that in your school? How do you see it playing out? What do we do to ride the right wave into the shore with kids? Chat about that for just a minute. I'll ask you to clap twice and we'll come back together. And develop an instant rapport with them. And there will be an element of trust, but to have real trust and that confidence in taking a risk, it's really long term. And I was, yeah, I was wondering um, if, you know, in your position, that's something that, you, I guess you have to facilitate it for other teachers, but do you miss it? Because that contact yeah. with the kids is so precious. Yeah. And um, one of the things, though, in my position, it is a little bit unusual. Or, and in some ways, it's kind of like yours because you're kind of in a looping now situation with children for several years. And that is that I get to know kids when, when they are identified for our gift and magnet program in fourth grade. And then they continue in that system through eighth grade. So, it takes longer, but over time to develop relationships with students. And then I go, even though we're not a unit district, I go to the high school and I continue to try to follow them in that way. So you do develop that long term. I try to anyway. I mean, again, you know, contact, you know, maybe once a week or once every two weeks. Certainly, it's not equivalent to 180 days out of the school year. But you know, do what I can in that way. I really enjoy seeing that as you're doing now in your school. Okay, gang, if you can hear me, clap twice. Great. Comments, questions, misgivings, anything that you'd like to raise at this point? If I would recommend one book for you to read, I, I really think if every faculty would have a dis common discussion around that book mindset, it would make a huge difference in how we function with kids in school. The, the whole title of the book is just Mindset, and the author is Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K. You can get it on Amazon.com. Really, really worth reading. Also fascinating if you're a parent, because Mindset has a really lot to do with how you parent as well. Okay, the second principle that I'd like to suggest to you is really a non-negotiable, not for us to be perfect with, but for us to be mindful of and to keep working toward if we want our classrooms to be responsive, is one that sounds like sort of a duh, because obviously if you're talking about differentiation, you're talking about trying to look at individual kids. But as I said to you yesterday, one of the real liabilities of teaching is that because we do have too much to do, we tend to look at kids as globs. And we realize that third period is the good class, and second period is the squirrely class, and fifth period is the one that wiggles too much. And of course, um, the good class may have a few more compliant kids in it or a few more kids that learn faster, but they're not all like that. And not everybody in that squirrely class is squirrely. And so really learning to look at kids as individuals rather than as herds is trickier than it seems because of the pressures on us. Um, what I'd like to do here for a minute is to engage you in a discussion about um, a teacher who's trying to work with kids as individuals in her classroom and see what you think about this. What would you say to her about her attempt to deal with kids' individual needs? Ms. Parker likes to use centers in her primary classroom. While they take time to create, they make, she feels they make good use of student time. And besides that, she can use them for a number of years after she creates them. She finds the centers to be particularly effective with skills work in things like reading, writing, and mathematics. Students work at the centers for about an hour every morning. There's a chart on the wall that shows the students the order in which they'll go to each center. The teacher rings a bell in the classroom to let them know when it's time to move from one center to another center. And the kids really have learned the routines of going to centers so that they know what to do when they get there and they know how to work and they know where to put their work when they finish and how to get help if they need it. Ms. Parker is very careful to plan center time so that each student can go to each center each week. 
because they get upset if they have to skip a center. Talk about that for just a second and think about the notion of trying to deal with individual needs in the classroom. Do you see some things she's doing well? Do you see some things that maybe aren't working? What has possibilities and what would you suggest to her she might change? Talk about that for just a second with each other. How's she doing with reaching out to individuals? The sentence where it says uh, she can use them for a number of years kind of makes it sound like, uh, okay, that job's done now for uh, X number of years where you probably need to be changing more fluid. to the new class that comes in, because not every class year to year is going to end up being the same. You know. Okay, if you can hear me, clap twice. I want us to look at two or three of these examples and see what you think. What would you suggest um, this teacher is doing that's positive? The goal here is for, for us to quit looking at herds and look at individual needs more. Do you see anything she's doing that seems positive to you in that regard? Yes. She's not utilizing whole group instruction during that time. She's making some attempts. She's not just using whole group instruction, and that's that's a big step forward. It really is. Um, in other words, individuals. Not every kid has to do everything exactly like at the same moment. They can move a little differently. They can start in different places. They can rotate. And that, maybe not for the kids, but for us, is a big step forward in flexibility. So that's kind of a bonus. Anything else you see that looks positive to you? Yeah. Kids seem to be motivated to go. They don't want to miss, so they're engaged. Yeah, and, and some of that engagement, the fact that they don't want to miss what's going on in the classroom, at least according to her, probably has something to do with the fact that they can get up and move around a little bit and they don't just feel like a herd. They have some more independence and they know what to do when they're in the place working, which is empowering for kids. What else might she do to get closer to individuals here? In other words, it would be easy to look at this class and assume, well, sure, she's differentiating, get different kids are working at different centers and they're moving around the room on their own. It's not just whole group instruction. That's, that's it. What else might you be looking for here? It doesn't say it in the writing, but it could free her up to work with individuals or small groups. It could free her up to work ah. with individuals or small groups. Yeah, that could be a real positive in the sense that if the kids are working at the centers and they know what to do there, she's free to sit down with a small group or to work with an individual to really help push them forward, and that's massively important. So I think that's a real a real bonus, the structure is in place to allow her to reach out to individuals and small groups. What else might be a good next step? Is she assessing to see if those students actually need that skill work that she's doing in the centers? Yeah, and this is a point that we really miss often. Um, this is here because it's something that I see really commonly. Um, we feel like it is such an improvement to have kids working somewhat independently at the centers and they kind of like that and that becomes differentiation. But we have no evidence that she's checking to see who needs which skill and that she's placing the student with the skill that works appropriately for them. We don't have any indication that she might be noticing that some kids are missing some things from last year and that centers are great places for them to work backwards even while she's trying to work forwards with kids. We don't have any indication that she's noticing that some kids have already mastered what's at the center and therefore she's giving them something else to do. So we don't have any evidence that she's naming the skills they're supposed to have, assessing to see where kids are in regard to those skills and adjusting the work in the center based on what she found out. And that's differentiation. This is just sort of flexible movement in a classroom, but it's not differentiation in, in, in its heart in any way. And a clue for that for me is always this thing. Every kid has to do everything in every center. And frequently teachers will say they're upset if they have to skip something. 
That may be, but it's very easy to say to kids, you know what? I sat up last night and thought about just what you need, and today I'm going to send you to a center that's just right for you. I planned it for you, and I can't wait to see how you do when you get there. And suddenly that's just about the coolest thing in the world, you know, and the kids can make that shift. With very young children, you can say, you know what, my job is to help you find your next step in learning, and your next step may be different than anybody else's in the class. And we'll have had a good day if we get your next step taken care of. And the work in this center is to help you do your next step so that you can grow. Kids can understand that even at a young age. And so I think that sense that the kids will be unhappy probably is an indicator that it's life as they're used to it and it's the way they think things are supposed to be, but if you help them find a new way of thinking, they can go there pretty easily with you because they have a lot of life connections with that. So I think this teacher is making some progress in flexibility, and one of the most important things to me is that given this routine, she truly now can sit down with small groups and individuals and work with them. Don't know if she is, but she could. But until you're saying, ooh, the center's become really powerful when I can let a kid work on what he or she needs in a place, skip something if they don't need it, and spend more time someplace if they need that, then you haven't quite gotten where you're trying to get yet. When you have um, open-ended tasks, and the idea is just that because the task is open-ended, kids are differentiating for themselves. What you really sort of end up with there is more of a diagnosis than a prescription. And I hear that a lot, especially in secondary classes. Teachers will say, I, I wrote the task for the kids so that it's very open-ended. And that means kids who are really great with technology will integrate more things and use it in a more creative way. And kids who aren't so good will just kind of scale down their expectations for themselves and do what they're capable of, but everybody's trying to solve the same problem. And it's differentiated because each kid will do what they can do. The place where the logic falls in that is that our job as the teacher is to push a kid beyond what they know how to do. And that means that we have to teach them something or push them something somewhere to that new place. And if we give tasks to kids and we say each of them does what they can do and therefore it's differentiated, that's a diagnosis. That's showing us what they can do. It's not then taking them to the next step. Do you understand what I'm saying there? That taking them to the next step is a big deal for us as teachers. And if what we do is predominantly open-endedness, then in a way we keep giving kids diagnostic tasks because a kid can only show us how to do what they know how to do. Our job is then to push them to the next step and show them the next thing to do and make sure they get the help they need to go there. In the next video, Dr. Tomlinson continues her discussion of differentiation as a means of challenging students and taking them to the next step in their learning as she compares and contrasts various approaches to differentiation.